So with, with that, it is 7.06. We're gonna circle back to lots of those things that we just talked about. So let's get started with the official having class. Uh, so here we are. I think I am screen sharing. I am, and we're good to go. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about the wood shop. We've, our website unit is short and sweet and to the point. I'm excited to see what comes up in show and tell to see what happened. Um, if you haven't yet sent us the URL to your website, and it's okay if you haven't, there is that link on the foundation Slack. You could send it there at some point over the course of the next hour or so while I'm just yammering on about woodshop things. And then that way it'll be there to pop up and we can all check it out when it's when it's show and tell time. Um, also, if you don't have one yet, that is completely fine. I wanna say it often that this is not school. And if you had a busy week and, and we're gonna see it next week, that's totally fine. Uh, it's just fun to be able to celebrate and share what you've learned all together to sort of see that as a shared experience and uh, be excited and get good ideas and have good conversation around it. So with that, uh, we're gonna start talking actually about the wood shop. So we're gonna do, here's a quick outline of what this week is gonna be, what we're gonna talk about, all the different things. First, we're gonna talk about Make Haven badges, which several of you have probably already started to think about. Then we're gonna do a quick overview of different types of wood that you might have or get or be, or be using. And then we'll do how to connect wood pieces, some starter projects, some terms that you might wanna know. Then we'll do the progression of squaring. So how do you go from a piece of rough lumber like I've got here with me, um, some rough stuff. And how do you go from that to like a nice square piece? And so we'll go through some of that process as a theory, and then we'll talk about other power tools and hand tools, all things that you might get batched. This isn't really gonna be di too directly focused on um, projects itself. And that's partially because of how Makehaven is, it works, right? Makehaven, you get badges, they sort of verify your safety. And then once you've got that and you, you've got the badge checked, then you can go after it with the projects. If you only have a few woodshop tools, it can feel kind of limiting for what's going on. So we really want to take a full week and just let you get your badges for the woodshop um, because that can take some time. So with that, here's, here's this, the process. And I'm going to share these with you. So don't feel like you have to write these furiously down while they're there. It's also maybe not the best contrast, which I am now realizing. But if you want to get your badges, the big thing that you're going to do is go to makehaven.org slash all badges, all dash badges, uh, or makehaven.org slash equipment. I usually go to that one, makehaven.org slash equipment. It's kind of funny. I'll start to just refer to makehaven.org slash and then a word because they are that logical. It's really honestly how I remember them because the navigating the web, JR worked really hard on that website and I'm not gonna speak ill of it. Because <laughs> uh, it's hard to build a website with fantastic navigation. Um, and that's all we have to say, but the makehaven.org slash equipment is a, is a good way to go. Then once you're at the piece of equipment that you like, you pull up the badging video, you watch the badging video, you take a quiz, uh, passing that quiz puts you in a pending status. And then you can schedule a time with a facilitator to really knock out the details of of that badge and so once you get to the pending status like here's let's see i can go actually i should have pulled this up ahead of time but i can go to my own makehaven account and uh list of badges to, 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 to my my membership my profile and badges i'm going to pull this up and put it up on the screen for you so this is this is me this is my profile uh which you can find all sorts of things on here but in here, these are all of the badges that are linked for me. So all the way down through this, you can see all of these badges. And then these are the ones that I've checked out with people. And I think I'm still at 50. I haven't moved the badges needle very much. That's a lot of badges. Um, but then here's pending status. So I've got these ones where I watched the video. I took the quiz. I'm ready to get badged. I just haven't coordinated with somebody to make this particular badge happen for myself. So if you're going through the procedure, you watch the video, take the quiz, and then you sit in that pending status until you meet a person and actually check out the skill with, with someone who can see you use the tool. And then the facilitator will be the one who moves you from pending into like full use badging. 
Um, and so this is where we're going to work together to make sure that you get some time with people this week to collect the badges that you would need in the wood shop. It can, like we said, can take some time. So we want to make sure that you have that. And then once you have the badge, the badge is actually an RFID card, the one that has your, your face in it, lets you in the door, but it also lets you turn on several pieces of equipment. Not everything is tied to that system, but there's many like the table saw or the compound miter saw, anything that's sort of higher, higher stakes um, for safety, we make sure that it's behind one of those badges. So that's a, that's a really neat piece, but it's a, that's the progression. So we're going to, you'll, you'll get more familiar with that, even if it still feels, feels like a weird process right now. Um, but what, what we're going to do is talk about woodworking this week. So let's first talk a little bit about wood. And I don't know about you, but my first impressions when still very new to woodworking was that buying wood, you just go to the store and then you buy some and then it's, and then you have it and then you cut it and then you make a thing. And I, I don't want to rain on anybody's parade, but wood is oddly technical. Uh, it's, a, it's a very oddly technical material. You can buy it in many different ways. This is from a Branford wood shop that I was at last week, um, Zawalik and Sons, which is neat. There's where you can buy slabs and pieces. There's also City Bench, which has a mill in Hamden, I think. There's places where you can buy slabs, you can buy two by fours, you can buy hardwood, there's like rings, that, there's a bunch of different places around. Um, and then uh, importantly, that didn't exist for the last round of foundations, we actually sell some solid wood in the back also and some plywood. So if you wanted to buy some of that here, but transporting it would be a nightmare and it always is, um, you can buy it here and the prices are really reasonable. So you can buy it here, use it here, and then come away with enough cutting boards for the family uh, for a, re you know, a reasonable price. Um, and I don't, there's really not any markup that happens on those boards. I wouldn't, if it was a bad plan, I wouldn't sell it to you, but it's a good, it's, it's very easy to not have to schlep it around. Uh, Robin, what's up? I see you have a raised hey. hand. Hey, I yeah. just wanted to ask, um, how much is um, the slab of, um, of wood? That is a great question. The slab of wood for, um, like the wood that's here is going to be, hold on, I'm adjusting my sound also. The, the wood that's for sale here is like somewhere often in the under $10 region. So there's that. Okay, there's great. also, yeah, sometimes it's, it's good if you've got a friend, you can share the price with them. If, you, if you're like, hey, I want to do a project and only need to have this board. There's multiple times where I split the price of a sheet of plywood with someone or buy a board and cut it in half. It's usually enough for a couple of cutting boards. Um, and then for many projects, especially this week when you're just getting badged, I would not be buying hardwood. I would just go to the scrap pile in the back and pull a piece of scrap and use that. The, the solid wood is that's shown here is something that you work up to, but it's not a right now kind of purchase. You can think about it and start to imagine what that's going to be. But as we talk about it being sort of technical, we'll sort of we'll build to that as a thing that you use in your in your processes. So trying to put in context different categories of wood, this could be an entire, you know, this could be its whole own thing. I essentially in my brain break it into three categories. All wood fits into three buckets for me. There's hardwoods. Um, which are the fancy, you know, like the cherry, oak, the maple, walnut, the things that people want their cabinets to be made out of, or like a nice piece of furniture. They want a hardwood most often. And those can be really nice looking. They can be beautiful pieces. You can get full featured grain, all sorts of color. They're, they're really fantastic. Um, and you can buy them pre-dressed. You can buy them in a really rough state. There's all sorts of different ways to do that. But this can be a, a pretty cheap way to get access to really fancy wood. And, and so those are neat. I would also organize sprune, spruce, pine, and fir. That's sort of the construction grade lumber, like the two by fours that you might buy at Home Depot or Lowe's. That is very soft wood. You can dent it with your thumbnail. It's, not, it's perfectly fine to build a wall, which feels weird to say that soft wood is for walls and houses. Um, but it's for, it's for that purpose. It's not to build furniture where you'd be directly manipulating it all the time. And so, because then you, you might eventually over time dent it or hurt it. And so this softwood is good for bulk purchasing. 
where you've got very cheap boards. And then plywood is its own technical field where there's many different categories and types of plywood. Most of the time people pass projects through here with, they like to do a lot of Baltic birch plywood because it's a very high end plywood product, but there's also plenty of good reason to buy the $35 sheathing if you're gonna use it to make jigs or to buy, or if you're gonna cover it with upholstery. There's also good ways to use cheaper plywood products in different sorts of ways, but there, there's many technical categories to those that we'll also spend a little more time with next week. Um, but in general, I think about woods as hardwoods, these SPF woods that are too soft for most of our projects here, and then plywood that is, uh, that is just that big sheet good. So how do you connect wood? This is something that we'll look at a lot more next week, but it's worth talking about just quickly here. What, and the amazing one is the first one. Wood glue is most often how you're going to connect things together. This little rake thing that I made yesterday is all held together with wood glue and that's it. Um, wood glue is stronger than the wood most of the time. So if you have two pieces of wood, you connect them at a right angle and then break that right angle piece of wood, it almost always breaks in the wood, not in the glue. The wood is stronger than the, or the glue is stronger than the wood and it's really fascinating to see that. Uh, that said, there's a couple of caveats. You should use a thin layer of glue. You don't want glue to be filling gaps. You want the wood to fit nicely together and then the glue just connects that. The, the glue is connecting a fiber to a fiber. It shouldn't be connecting to its own glue molecules, which is kind of a weird depth to think of it, but absolutely glue is good for thin layers between pieces of wood. Screws and nails are, and temporary fasteners Permanent and temporary fasteners for screws and nails. Screws are really great because they can come in and are out. You can also hide these completely. They're a great way to get some quick strength. If you wanna drill a hole, sink a screw in through it and then plug it with a piece of wood over top, you can completely hide that screw from the end, the, from the person who's sitting on the chair later on. There's complex joinery and, and Japanese joinery is, is pretty magical. There's lots of cultures that really that really prize this, but somebody put together a really nice um, Twitter account that's just a whole bunch of animations of Japanese joinery. And so they've got all these gifts that you can play and watch this crazy joinery technique. I think they modeled all this in SolidWorks, I, I believe, or maybe Rhino, but in here you can watch them sort of work their way through different joinery types to see what it looks like and to, to explore those ideas in lots of different ways. So there's all sorts of good examples that you can look at uh, for joinery techniques. And these are really impressive. They're really exciting. These are not a thing to get this week. If you're brand new to woodworking, this is definitely an aspirational goal. Um, Paul, you, I'm certain that you've heard people say that the pinnacle of woodworking is a nice, is a nice dovetail. Oh my gosh, all of it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so if you make a nice piece of dovetail furniture, dovetail, drawer boxes, you should be very proud. If this is your first week woodworking, that is not your goal this week. Don't, don't try for that. It's, it's something that takes a lot of precision, uh, a lot of practice with a saw to be able to, to pull it in the right direction. There's lots of different pieces that come along with that. To build on that, we have a member here who joined around the same time I did about two years ago, and their goal was to become good at dovetails. Um, I've watched them in here for two years, almost exclusively practicing dovetails. Um, if people ask about dovetails, I just drive them in that direction because honestly, if I've done two my whole life, that, that's, they're a work. So right. Yeah, it, it absolutely. If you find there's not a new furniture, you don't often see with dovetails in them. And it's because it is really, truly a, a, a piece of woodworking art. Um, and then the, the last one here is cyan acrylate, super glue, CA glue. Super glue may seem like a silly thing. If you've built lots of models, you might've used CA glue for that, uh, but it can be a really good way to fix pieces together. And there's even some tricks where you put CA glue between a couple pieces of tape to temporarily hold things really well. Um, and it's, it's a great trick. I've used all of these myself. I really think that each one has their own place and there's, there's definitely a dynamic to getting into how you use them. Uh, but they're, they're all perfectly valid ways to connect pieces of wood. So what are some good, if you're thinking about starter projects, and this is sort of building up to a starter project, this week's goal is, is not to do one of these, but to think about what tools you might need so the next week you could. 
And so a uh, floating wine bottle holder, and I think we, well, we had one. Here's a sort of a wine bottle holder up here in the front, right in front of the TV. That's just sort of a hole drilled through a piece of wood. There's also some other tricks where you can have, uh, I think there's one in the end. Is there still a floating wine bottle holder I think there is, in yeah. the front glass? We can go grab that uh, after and show you what that looks like. But cutting boards, charcuterie boards, picture frames, these are great places to start. If you're brand new to woodworking, trying some of those, especially the boards are fantastic. It's wood glue to put them together. It's just squaring the wood, which is good to be able to practice. They're fantastic starters. And if you send one to family, they're very excited to get it. Uh, it makes for, we're still with plenty of time left before anybody's holidays. You can certainly make some and then be sending them and, and have a happy family with all the stuff that you've sent out. Um, bowls and handles cut on the lathe are really fun. For the project that I did yesterday, I cut this handle on a lathe out of a piece of square stock. And so you can really nicely turn things like that. There's all, and then bowls are, are also fascinating. They're just, you know, bigger and rounder, but it works exactly the same. You can make birdhouses. Those are always fun starter projects. Uh, and then you can just work on dovetails flatly. And, and that's an amazing skill to get better at. And then simple boxes like desk organizers can be good. But as you're thinking about those, what you really need is, as you get started, woodworking is such a traditional art that it has lots of its own terminology. And so what's really important is for us to start to think about those terms and especially these three terms when you're thinking about a board. You need to be thinking about the end grain, which is sort of the end of the board, how it comes out at you. And so I'm gonna hold up this board at the camera, which is very small for people on Zoom perhaps, but the end grain is this stuff at the end of a board. It's, it's where the wood fibers are sticking right out at you versus the two other terms, which are edge grain. Edge grain is usually the skinnier side of the board. And then face grain is the big flat side of a board. We're gonna to refer to those a lot as we're talking about squaring wood and how you go through that process. Um, and they're really fascinating to see in different applications. Like here's an end grain cutting board and an edge grain cutting board. Uh, edge grain cutting boards are the easier of the two. End grain cutting boards people really like because they're better to keep your knife sharp. Isn't that? Yep. That's true. Okay. Just verifying. But end grain cutting boards take a little bit more technical know how because you have to glue up strips and then cut them again and then glue them a second time. It's a, it's a little bit like making two cutting boards worth of effort to make one cutting board. And so if you're getting started, definitely best to do these edge grain cutting boards first. Other things that are worth looking at, if you're thinking about where to build your table legs out of, you'll want to get them out of really straight grained pieces. And then there's these interesting ways that we cut up logs. And when you do that, you get different variations in how their grains show up. So you can have quarter sawn lumber or center cut. You can do this mixed weird thing, cathedral cut. Flat sawn is where you're sort of off here to the side. And then rift sawn. There's tons of different ways that and terms that people use to describe how lumber is cut. And it's pretty overwhelming at the start. So the best thing to do is to try and find the things that you can stay focused on. Uh, and it's, it's not to learn all of the terms right from, right from the beginning. But one thing that is interesting is to try and be able to identify reliably where's the end grain, which is the face grain, and where's the edge grain. Just to spot that on every single board that comes across so that you can see what's going on. But with that, the big thing that we're gonna talk about is how do you square up a board? That's one of the first things that you need to do in a wood shop if you're trying to be economical and buy rough sawn lumber like we might have in the back here at Makehaven. And so that's gonna take you through a, a wood squaring process. And we're gonna start off with this, this piece up here. I actually made this on Inkscape this week. That's a photo of end grain with a rectangle and a little roughness to it. And so this particular Inkscape image we're gonna to use to try and understand how you go from rough, rough lumber into perfectly square lumber. And so again, we're, we're just focused on the end grain. So this is this end grain piece right here. If you're on that journey from a rough piece of lumber, and I would consider everything up here rough lumber, even though this one looks kind of nice, even a nice looking board, if it's sat for a long time, it might be a little warped. If you feel it, it's not the nicest in the world. You could definitely make it a little cleaner, a little sharper. The first trip for most people is usually a trip to the joiner, which is this big thing that looks like a very oversized anvil in our shop. Uh, the joiner has a little spinning tooth right in the middle, 
and then an in-feed table and an out-feed table. The in-feed table is just below the cutter and the out-feed table should be exactly parallel with the top of the cutter. So that when you push a board in, you're taking off a 16th or a 32nd of the board, a very tiny little bit so that you get a nice smooth surface. And when you do that, you press the board into this, surf, into this table face. And when you do that, you press it down in such a way that you cut off this bottom edge. That's face jointing. So you can cut off the roughness on the bottom side and get one flat edge right there. Then if you use the fence along the back, the same exact idea for the face joining, your board lays down like this. So a face is down onto that cutting edge. And then for edge jointing, you tip it up on its side, trying to show the people at home. Uh, you tip it up on its side and you're cutting along an edge. So the, the name face and edge joining are the sides that you're cutting. And you'll definitely go over this with a facilitator if you're not the best at visualizing it right there. But in that process, what you're trying to do is just to get flat, planar sides. So everything fits in one two-dimensional plane. And then that fence and table should be 90 degrees to each other so that you can have two planes on your board that are 90 degrees perpendicular. That's the only thing the joiner does. It's a great tool. It's a big expensive tool. Uh, woodworkers with home shops will usually buy one of these towards the end of their tool buying journey because there's ways to work around without one, but we have one, so we may as well use it. Uh, any other important details to catch with the joiner, Paul? I'm going to keep asking because you're the facilitator, one yeah, of the facilitators. This is pretty good. I mean, there will be things to go over when you actually do the badging. Um, we can talk about things like grain orientation and tips to get better um, a better result in using the tool, um, but that gets best covered in the badging session. Yeah, I, I really agree. So this is definitely a whole topic where being hands-on can help quite a bit. So once you've made it through the jointer, which is good at cutting just two sides, then if you're trying to build something that's completely square, you need to get all four sides squared up. And so the place that you go next is the planer. Uh, and the, the planer, planer, maybe ER, uh, <laughs> but in here, what you get for the planer is that you make the top face of the board parallel with the bottom face of the board. A planer doesn't make the top flat. It makes it parallel to the bottom, which is tricky. Uh, I love Jen's first comment to me about the planer, which is banana in, banana out. <laughs> <laughs> you have to make a, a straight flat board so that when you put it to the planer, it makes the top straight and flat also. If you don't do that, you get, you get the same exact shape that's on the bottom put into the top, even if it's not what you want. Um, another thing with the planer is that it's a tool that you often have to worry a little bit about the input and output. If you have a lot of these boards, a lot of boards to do in the planer, sometimes it's good to try and get them to go in overlapping just a little bit. And then the last piece of squaring up an, a board while working in the, the wood shop is to get this last edge squared. And so we did the first one on the joiner, but the second one comes through on the table saw. The table saw is often the center of your entire workpiece. And once you've made it through squaring the board, you might do many more cuts with jigs and tools and other things on the table saw. But the table saw is how you get the last square piece because you can run the flat face along the table, a flat edge along this fence, and then you get your second flat edge perfectly parallel because the blade cuts it along there. The table saw is really good for many, many things, but fundamentally what it does is it cuts straight lines in just one direction. And so you get to do that to, to make your board completely square and rectangular or rectangular. But beyond that, the table saw can do many, many things. The table saw has lots of different sleds and tools and extensions so that you can really grow out what you're able to do. There's cross cut sleds. You can cut splines, which help reinforce corners. There's this vertical cutting jig, which ours looks a little different, but it's so that you can hold a piece upright and then make cuts safely. Uh, there's custom sleds that you can build if you want to cut some funky angle and hold pieces in exactly the same way for maybe multiple table legs box joints if you're if you're on your way to dovetails a good a good intermediate step is a box joint they're much easier to cut you can do the table saw for all of it um and if a good box a good box joint jig can really make those into a nice event and then you can you can do picture framing sleds also these are pretty fancy we have one 
Uh, ours isn't exactly like this one, but there's some neat tricks that you can do with it if you're trying to build picture frames. And so th there's tons and tons of different kinds of sleds. A common thing that woodworkers will talk about, and we'll talk about this more next week, is building jigs so that you can build the things that you actually want to build. So not your final product, but you build something that helps you get there. And I've got some in the room that we can definitely take a look at. Um, another tool that's useful is the bandsaw. This is some people love the bandsaw and will just just do bandsaw projects. Like these down here at the bottom, these are bandsaw boxes, where if you're just good at the bandsaw and you have a real short blade, you can make projects completely and entirely on a bandsaw. There's a fair amount of people like in their own garage, they might just buy a bandsaw and boom, that's, you know, that's a couple of years worth of woodworking fun right there, just one tool. Um, but for us, if we're still thinking about squaring boards, a bandsaw can be a great way to take a thick board like this one that I've got here that's maybe two inches thick, and you can cut it right down the middle so you have two thinner boards, which is rip cutting and rip cutting or resawing, resawing is what it is. Uh, if you're resawing a board, you can get two smaller pieces from that one large one. And it can be a really nice process. You can do it before or after squaring. Usually you want to do it after it's relatively square so that you get a relatively square output. Uh, but the bandsaw can be lots of fun. Then there's also the sliding compound miter saw, miter saw. I call this one the chop saw. Um, it's the one, if you've ever trimmed a house, if you've ever done molding or like baseboards or, or ceiling, ceiling molding, uh, crown molding, this is the tool that you have at your house to do it because you can cut whatever angle you want. It can do angles in multiple directions. You can rotate things around, but it's really good for cross cutting the fibers of a piece of wood. And so it's really nice to do that job with a compound miter saw because you can you lay the piece along this fence that's right here. And then once the wood is laid across, basically you keep your fingers out of this yellow danger zone. You pull the saw down and it'll cut it wherever it is. And I think this has a 14 inch capacity for us. It's very large. So you can cut a lot of, of board size on this compound miter saw. Um, and they're, they're great for, this is one of the tools that I definitely owned myself when doing home renovations because it's so useful for trim and molding. But there's a lot of other tools that we have in our wood shop, things that it might be fun to get badges for that cover a whole range of things. We've got the scroll saw. This is a little tiny saw that's just tucked around the corner in the wood shop behind the Gerber CNC. This is a lot, it looks and feels a lot like the bandsaw, but on a teeny tiny scale. And, and for that reason, it's actually really fascinating uh, to use. This is one, Darcy, if you haven't met Darcy yet, he's a great guy. He makes signs that are really beautiful. You can check him out on Slack. Uh, and he, for a long time, was using just the scroll saw to do artistic sign work. And so he's sold those as like actual products, which is really cool. The scroll saw is really good at detail cuts and it's pretty safe. Uh, you can you can directly use your hands and fingers right up to it. Just the front edge of the blade is a cutting surface. Uh, I used to actually have these at the school where I taught and would have middle schoolers run this machine without a lot of direct, like I need to be watching you right, in, right on top of you sort of supervision. It's a fairly safe machine for sure. I would even, this is maybe a, a less than good example, would show that it's safe by, you can touch the back of the, band, of the scroll saw blade and it's got so little movement that it jiggles your skin, it does not cut it because there's no cutting edge. Don't do that with one of the spiral cutters because those cut on all sides, but one that's just cutting on the front, they're actually so safe that you can accidentally touch the blade and you may not even get cut on the, on the back side of it where there's not teeth. These are really fun. This is a really fun tool. If you're just trying to do a little detail work, um, it can be a lot of fun. Where I, where I grew up, there was Cedar Point like a, and Six Flags or like the Big E. There's probably people at, at those places where you can walk up and say, my name is Carol and I would like to have a sign of my name. And they'd use a scroll saw to cut your name out uh, and make you something really quick on the fly. This is often the kind of tool where if you have the right kind of stock, you can crank out little projects really quick and efficiently. It's a fun one to learn. It sounds a little scary, but, it, but it's, really, it's really fun. Uh, the panel saw is a, another one that's huge. It's a very large tool but it only does one thing. It cuts up big flat panels. So if you come in with a sheet of plywood or you buy a sheet of plywood from the back, those can be upwards of like 40 to 60 pounds, depending on how big and thick and whatever it is. And so oftentimes you'll wanna cut those up because if you're gonna use them on the table saw, they're just too big and unwieldy. 
And so the panel saw is a way to take this circular saw and just slide it down the track right here, or you can slide the piece of wood past it and make cuts that break it up into much smaller pieces. This is a, a pretty niche, niche saw, but it works really well for what it does, cutting up full sheets of plywood into much smaller pieces. If you feel like you're gonna build with plywood, this is definitely a good badge to get. Uh, the drill press is a fun one. This is another one that's that's nice. It's a good it's a good one to try and use um, because it gives you the stability that a hand drill doesn't necessarily have. If you're if you're a person who hasn't always had luck with a hand drill, then this is a good one to make sure that your drill your drilled holes are always straight, right up and down, uh, and you can usually have pretty precise control for where the thing's going to end, how deep you make all your your drills and your cuts. I used it to drill all the holes that these little dowels went into so that I would know that they went through deep in, but not all the way through. So you can get a lot more reliability and repeatability with a drill press than you would with just a hand drill. So it's a great tool to have in your arsenal. There's a little table that you can mount things to so you can clamp, you should clamp down your piece of material that you're going to work with because they, they can go spinning and flying. Uh, but it is a great way to make things, especially if you're going to try and do stuff repeatedly. You can pre um, pin where you want to do drills, which can be really helpful, or you can make a, a jig, a place where you sort of shove a piece in. If you want to drill the same hole in 16 different pieces, you make a little fence where you push the, the piece of wood right up into that fence, and then it stays in the same spot when you go to drill, you can drill reliably. The wood lathe is a, is a fun one. The wood lathe is a totally separate. All the tools that we fit together, I would put them in rectilinear woodworking, in rectangular square woodworking. The lathe is a completely different animal. If you get really down into the, the arts and sciences of words within woodworking, the, the lathe terms are totally separate. A person who does woodworking and only on the lathe is called a turner not a woodworker and they they can be pretty particular about that uh it's sort of like the knitting crochet difference they they don't like to get those mixed up and so there's turners they have all sorts of do, are you familiar with all of those terms oh no not all of them yeah I, I any any fun ones pop into mind these these terms aren't ones that i keep on the top of my head but it's definitely a good skill set to have um and there's plenty of commonalities to this lathe as there are to the metal lathe but I would 100% recommend you get started on this one first because you wanna play around with this. You can sort of feel how it's going. It is sort of delightful how hands-on the lathe work is, that it's, it's very like touch and go, that you can feel the action happening, that you can see it in front of you. If, if you think that the other ones are gonna to be too, uh, require too much planning for you at first, this can be a great one to just sort of hop in, you try it, you make a weird handle for a thing, and if it comes out a weird shape, you just make it a little smaller. Uh, <laughs> and it sounds like a strange thing, but it's a great, it's a great place to get started because it's so different from the rest. And there's tons of cool stuff that can be done. Usually sitting in this window right above it are a bunch of examples of things that people have made. I think that, Je uh, that Lior made a baby rattle in the past year. There's been uh, plenty of candle holders get made on this thing. You can, you can make the handles for what will later be spoons. There's all sorts of different stuff that you can do on the wood lathe. Uh, just to build on that, one of the things that I like to look at the difference is woodworking can be very mathematical. Um, and especially if you're trying to build like cabinets or anything, like there's just a lot of geometry that has to be considered. This is kind of the opposite to me. I feel like this is more like it's artistic or in your conversation with the wood. You can plan something, but if you encounter a weird grain structure, it might go in a completely different direction and you kind of got to go with it. So um, it can be a really fun tool in that, in that space. There's a lot of exploring. Yeah, it's like very close to, to jazz woodworking. <laughs> it's, <jazz. laughs> it's, it's the jazz version of woodworking, for sure. Um, yeah. And so there's, there's, that's a really fun one uh, to, to definitely learn. And then the router table, is sort of the spiritual center of another whole category of what we're gonna do. Routers are really fascinating tools. There's a fair amount of complexity to them. Uh, and I would say if you're, if you're imagining the tools that are at the center of a wood shop, I'd say the table saw is probably the, the core of what most woodworkers would think of as the primary woodworking tool. And a close second I would categorize as the router table. 
because there's many things that it can do that are hard to do with any other tool or almost impossible to do with other tools. And, and that's hard to wrap your head around at first until you start to see these, these profile edges of what their tools can do. Essentially, a router is just a spinning tool, a spinning sharp edge. And so you can have them be relatively square, like this rabbiting bit here. You can have dovetail bits like this one. And you can see that it's got a, an angle to it. And when it spins, it's going to cut an angle into a piece of wood. You can also get raised panels, style and rails. There's all sorts of different pieces and designs that you can get with a router table. And there's an almost endless list of router bits that you can have. Uh, but they can do lots and lots of different finishing things for all of your pieces. Any kitchen cabinet that you've seen, all of the detail work on those boards, they were cut with router bits. The curves in the top of uh, baseboards were cut with router bits. The detail in crown molding that makes it look so nice up at the top, all cut with router bits. There's a, a wildly broad range of tool of tooling that can happen here that can give you all sorts of different outcomes. Really nice ones are that you can have bearings put on the end of your router bits that will help you track the edge of a piece of wood. So if you have a couple of pieces that you wanna get in line or if you have a template that you'd like to cut out to, you can use a templating bit to make those things happen. This is definitely one that you get better at with some practice and a few videos to see how it's going. And I'm gonna spam real hard with videos this week. I apologize in advance, uh, but woodworking is something that's best seen rather than talked about. And so, whoops. And so with the router, I definitely wanna encourage you to take a look at what this is, but this spinning tool is something that we're gonna see when we get to CNC work also. Essentially all of our, our CNCs, the brand new Shapoko that we just got put in, the Gerber, the Tormach, the, there's lots of different tools throughout the space that are CNC router bits. And all of them have this as their spiritual center. This is the spindle for most of those tools, a spinning end mill that can make cuts and then it does so in a really nice way. Um, we're gonna, there's a really good video by Jonathan Katz Moses about slow motion end mills so that you can see how these things cut and sort of the different reasons why you'd use a straight cut bit or a round, uh, uh, up cut bit or a down cut bit or a compression bit. And I'm gonna send you that link directly so you don't have to go looking for it. But it's a really, a really neat video to sort of see how this works at a, at a granular level in a high speed camera. So it's a, it's a cool way to check that out. Um, one detail that you wanna do with the router bit is that because we're holding things by hand when we move it through the router table, you wanna always go opposite the tool. You don't wanna go in the same direction. It's fine if a robot does that because the robot has a really strong grip on everything. Uh, but for us, we wanna go opposite so that you get little tiny bites that come out and it can't grab it and then push it in the direction that it's moving. So you always on our router table wanna to go to the left. When you're standing there having a piece in front of you, you always want to go to the left on the piece. And it's it there's an arrow that's on there down here that says move to the left. That's definitely true. But really what you want to be doing is opposing the spin of the bit. So if you get to a point where you have to cut on the back side, you have to go to the, the then I'm not even going to say it out loud. You have to go the opposite way of the spin so that you always go opposite the spin direction. So those are the, that's the collection of power tools, which is not even all of them. These are hand power tools or totally, these are the analog, yeah, analog, pneumatic and electric hand tools. So if all of those power tools are exciting or maybe a little bit scary and you, and you feel like you wanna connect with your, your uh, woodworking past a couple generations ago, hand tools can be a good way to go. Have a question? The, ooh, that's a really good question. There's a hand, so there's multiple ways to cut circles, but it's tricky on most any machine. The easiest way to do it is to fire up the CNC and have it do it for you. But the, you can do it with a handheld router and a circle cutting jig where you adapt a handheld router, which is in the electric tools over here. Yep, and then you go around in a circle. You can do the same sort of thing with a bandsaw where you basically center mount a piece and then you spin it into the bandsaw blade. There's a few different ways to do it, but they're all sort of making trickery of how it's supposed to work. But they're really, they're really great. Um, in the analog tools, none of, none of these are particularly good at that. 
This is where if you've got lots and lots of time and you really want to savor the woodworking, using hand tools is the way to do that. And there's totally people that love every second of just like slowly going away with a planer, trying to get something nice and flat and smooth. They really enjoy that sort of catharsis of it. Um, but in there, there's, there's all sorts of different saws, like a dovetail saw, the crosscut saw, bench planes. Bench planes are these things that look Let's see, these are linked to the actual Make Haven page, but it's gonna take forever to load. Um, we've got low angle planes. One of the things, there's multiple hand saws. There are push saws and pull saws. There's those two different categories have a few different reasons. A push saw are the more triangular ones that you're gonna see. A push saw is a little thicker and it's it cuts on the push stroke. Those I would say generally, um, have a, a little bit more of a, of a stiffness to them. If you were to pick one up and give it a flick, it's not gonna wobble at all. Pull saws are thinner because metal can handle tension better. Metal as a material is generally better as a piece that's in tension than in compression. Um, and so a pull saw you can pull and it doesn't need to be nearly as thick to stay just a stiff. A pull saw can do a really nice job of making delicate little cuts that are, are very well done. If you want to cut dovetails, it's almost always going to be with a pull saw because they're much smaller, much easier to control, and they cut on the pull, which is a little bit easier to control in the actual motion of it. Um, and so there's different types of categories there. The pull and push saws do not have badges. They're not, um, they're not things that you, that you get particular badges on. There is a fine woodworking cabinet that you could get a badge on and it's definitely a good idea to discuss but over here just on the edge you can see that there's some some saws in here these are both push saws they have a little ridge a reinforcement across the top this one is a pull saw uh, which doesn't have any reinforced ridges along its along its length because it's a little bit stronger hand planes like this are for making things perfectly flat this is the old way before a jointer or a planer existed before we had the electricity to do that we would use these tools and lots and lots of effort to make wood flat and square. And so you can totally get good at that. There's some really good reason to know how to use these even in a world where those power tools exist. Because sometimes you just wanna touch up one little feature and these can be the way to do it without having to move around, figure out how you mount it in the machine. How do you clamp it and push it through safely? Sometimes these can be a real win across the board. And so let's see, hop back over to here. These analog tools can be something that's really useful to master. Pneumatic tools are also really, really handy in the wood shop. These are air powered tools and a nail gun is easily the one that jumps to my mind first, but there's all there's air blasters, which just sort of blow the dust away. That's really helpful, especially in a world with masks when you wanna get dust off of something to get a good clean look at it. We have an air gun right in the middle of the room. And so that sort of a thing hanging right above Lisa. That is a super handy, but any of those hookups, you can also connect to a nail gun if you wanna put in full length nails, little tiny pins. Some of the smallest pins for a nail gun, they can be so small that they basically disappear. You don't even know that you have them in your workpiece once, you're, once you've got them in there. So it's a really neat way to make those, uh, to make connections or even just to hold stuff while it's gluing. And then there's these electric hand tools. Lots of these do have badges, um, and there's tons of different ways to go at it. We actually have what feels like almost an entire second category. There is an electric planer, there's, uh, there's orbital sanders, dovetail, rip, the dovetail saw, there's all sorts of trim routers, plunge routers, all sorts of different tools, basically everything that has a mounted fixed version. Almost all of them, we have a, a hand cut version where you're in control of it. You could pick it up and walk around with it. And so those tools are really neat. I would categorize them as being, if you're trying to decide, do I use the hand planer or the, the fixed planer? The fixed planer is almost always gonna give you a slightly better end result, but there's some cases where you can't put your board through the planer. If it's 14 inches wide, it doesn't fit. And then you might need to use the hand planer. If, you're, um, if you have something that is really, really too large to manage or maybe too thick for the panel saw, you might need to get out the circular saw, set it up on some foam or some sacrificial boards and make some cuts that way. 
Uh, the Sawzaw is a fun one. I had one of these at home for when cutting out two by fours and things like that from for demolition in a house. I don't know where it would be useful in woodworking per se uh, for fine woodworking, but it's definitely useful when trying to gut a house and do remodeling. Um, there's all sorts of different tools that exist here. A good one is odd, the oscillating multi-tool can be really helpful for little tiny things. Um, the finished sanders are definitely gonna be something that you need across the board. There's some sanders like that that can be really helpful. And then the steamer is one. This is the one that I'm trying to learn how to do. These wood steamers, you can heat up wood. And then once you heat up all the wood fibers, you soften the lignin in between the wood fibers. And then you can take a piece of wood and bend it sort of like a very stiff al dente noodle. And so it's a neat way to be able to use steam to bend wood in ways that it shouldn't normally fit. And if you look around at dining room table, chairs and those sorts of things, bent wood is in your life more often than you might think it is. So keep an eye out. You'll see that a lot of the time there's been little pieces of bent wood to reinforce uh, fine woodworking around you. Back to these slides. But those are, there's lots there. We went through a whole bunch um, and, and perhaps too, too many things. But with all of those different concepts, words, ideas, tools, the, the big thing is that sometimes when you get to the end of one of these talks is what's the next thing that you need to do? What's the, what's the next progression that has to happen? And so for you guys who are right now sitting here listening, the, the next thing you do would be to watch some of the badging videos, take those quizzes, and then get signed up for badging sessions. We're gonna, normally it's gonna be, you set it up with one-on-one. -on -one. I think I have pulled up, let's see. It is in one of these. If we go to maker resources or member community facilitator schedule, if you'd wanna schedule, you'd normally get to it by coming to the facilitator schedule and then you'd say schedule with a facilitator. So this is normally not this week, um, you can totally do this this week, but normally, and if you're badging on something outside of the cycle where we're all together, you'd get this particular spreadsheet pulled up. And within here, you can start to see exactly who signed up for what, when do they go, how does all this work? And this is really, really helpful for trying to make a plan and know if the person's gonna be there for you. And so like for us, we've got, let's see where we are. Uh, like in here, we're at 927, which is uh, today we've got Paul is going to be facilitating in the wood shop tomorrow. And you can see that several people have already signed up, but there's also this availability for second members or add-ons. For us, we've put in for all of our woodworking people, we've got foundations sort of blocked off for them over the next couple of rounds. So on Tuesday, tomorrow, Thursday, and Sunday, we have woodworking facilitators who are here and we'll be able to give you badges on all of those tools that we just listed off. And it's gonna be helpful to watch some videos, do some quizzes, and then pick one of those three times this week or maybe a couple, come on in and get yourself some badges. That's, that's really gonna be your only assignment. I'm gonna hop back over to the slides. That's your only assignment for the week is just to go and collect badges Keeping in mind that next week, we're gonna say, make a simple starter project. So if you wanna get started on making a cutting board this week while thinking about your badges, or maybe pick the badges that would let you do the cutting board next week, that could be a good plan, uh, but you wanna think about that. So the big thing is that tomorrow, Thursday and Sunday are the badging times. And you just wanna make sure that you can come in for one of those to be ready to go. I will actually be here for all of those, which I won't necessarily always be all those times, but, this particular week I'm going to be. Uh, and then start to think about what you'd like to make next week. That's the, the core of what we want you to do this week, which is, it may not sound like it's necessarily a lot, but watching those videos can really be a time worm, uh, wormhole. And we wanna respect the fact that that can take enough time that just, just that alone is perfectly fine for the week's goals. So there'll be plenty to do just in getting those up and ready and deciding which ones you want to go after. But um, Thanks, Kevin. please. Okay, so um, so badging is a really great process. You said that you start with a video, goes to a quiz, then we do it in person, watch you do it. It's really good. We can answer questions during that time. Um, 
you'll leave that session understanding how you use that tool. You may not be great with that tool, but you at least will have the competency to approach it on your own. Um, some of the badging processes go really, really quick to do the jigsaw. That's it takes a couple minutes. Um, to do the table saw takes many more couple minutes. That could be closer to an hour, depending um, on how many people are there um, and how much I'm rambling. So um, one thing I will say is kind of be prepared um, when you come on in um, for how long that tool might take. You'll get a good example for how long the video was. The table saw video was like a 45 minute video. Um, another thing, uh, the schedule accommodates for two names. I feel comfortable being able to do four people um, confidently on a tool at one time. So if you want to tack on, I'd say you're welcome to join. If there's only you know two names there, maybe add your name in addition to in the notes column. Uh, doesn't hurt though to also send a message in Slack just to give a heads up to the facilitator. And that kind of goes for all the facilitators because I can't speak to how many other um, instructors are comfortable doing up to like four people on a single table saw. Um, Corey did say that we have multiple tools that do the exact same thing. I mean, everything was done at one point in time with just a couple hand tools. And now we have all of these tools which are incredible, but don't feel like you need to know them all. Identify, okay, what are some things you might need to do? Table saw being a great one, but it's when you start to with some of the other tools, you might not need the router just yet. Um, you might need something more about dimensioning material, so to speak. Um, and then I would like to build on the dimensioning material part. Yeah, should we spin back to that? If, if we're cool, because I also remember yeah. I asked a question about price and I think I can elaborate slightly on that as well. That sounds good. Let me um, hop in and, and make some adjustments to what's being shared. Share screen. Do, do, Are you, so do we want members to dimension their own lumber or do we not care? Oh, uh, there's prices on the boards. <laughs> you mean the boards in the back? Because like they sell hardwood at like, uh, centers oh um uh, i think if so if i'm recommending how you buy a board if uh, if i were in your spot trying to say what to do this week use scrap wood next week if you're feeling confident and you want to build something out of hardwood or if you want to build a cutting board which is a great place to get started i would just buy one of the boards in the back and they're marked on the end of the board so when we talk about pricing um lumber is really funky the way it's priced it is it is priced by board foot which is length with depth. So your one foot board price will be different if your board is one inch thick or two inches thick. Um, I haven't bought a lot of lumber since prices kind of started to skyrocket during the pandemic, but I can tell you that cheaper woods, like popular, I was finding in like the three to six dollar a board foot range, probably more like three to four. Um, and then up from there and that's a foot of material dimensionally a cubic foot yeah and it's then a in, cubic foot in back we are selling entire boards for six dollars so that's a ridiculous deal yeah um you can also find hardwoods at like home centers that have already been kind of treated for you the quality of which it's kind of up in the air because they really don't have a very good selection process. But normally when you go to a place that sells hard lumber, they have vetted it and is normally a higher quality. We're not gonna get in the grading here. Um, but one thing to keep in mind when you buy a board, try to kind of pick something that has relative straightness to it. Um, there's cupping and bowing are two things that can happen. We're not gonna go into a ton of detail, but the more your board is twisted, the more it's gonna take for you to fix that twist. So if you can get something that's relatively straight, it's just going to be so much easier to get started. Um, absolutely. That was very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's we're going to get into all of that. Hopefully some of those subtleties are more a thing that you, they're on the roster for next week's things to talk about to make sure that we talk about them formally, but it's great to have those concepts floating around as we get headed in that direction. So um, any, let's see, any other things or I'd like to, any other questions before we start the show and tell? Yeah. yeah so, so say you run through the videos, take a quick measure, send in for 
So you start watching videos and you um, take the quiz and you're all set with that. And then mm -hmm. you want a book to have the facilitator, you know, clear you on these things. Is it better to uh, sort of batch certain kinds of tools together because other people are doing it then? Like, how do you figure out how to use the best of your time? That, no, that's a really good question. And um, one of the things that we're going to try and do this week is list out sort of generally the tools to go after. If you're doing it individually, a good thing to do is to send a message, like let's say two weeks from now, you're badging in the wood shop. I would, I would say, hey, Paul, I'd really like to work together for like an hour. I wanna bang through these eight badges. I've watched the videos, I'm in pending status, and I just wanna make sure that we check off each one of these eight things. Um, the first time that I came in to get badged, which was not a group setting, that's totally what I did with Jen, who's fantastic. We, we made it through, I think, like 15 badges in a go. Um, but there are things that I have lots of background experience with. And so it's a little bit faster of a badging process. Um, and so for this, I would say, since most of you are going to want to do similar things where you hop in the joiner, probably want to do the table saw in groups of four or so, um, maybe you want to do the router table. Some of those are going to go relatively quickly. And if we can post like who's coming and what tools you're interested in, Maybe we can find a happy medium where it sort of naturally works. Um, it, there's no instance where it's going to be a perfect solution, but we can all sort of work together as a, as a big happy family to try and make it happen. Um, we're also going to continue, like we're doing woodworking again next week. So if you miss out on a badge that you want to get next week, you can totally do that. We're also tentatively thinking about next week during these like open working times that where the woodshop facilitators are here of also thinking about just doing sort of an ice cream social pizza thing, just to like have us get to know each other a little and, and feel more like a team, like a collaborating group. There's some logistics we got to run through with that because, you know, there always are. Um, but we want to try and make sure that we feel like we're in this together as a group. And so we're, we're headed in that direction. We're thinking ice cream social or pizza maybe on the 10th. Is that, yeah. that was the, the, the rough guesstimate for that. Um, but yeah, so that, that wasn't a too direct answer, but hopefully it helps. Anybody else with questions? Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about your badging process? Yeah, so on Thursday, I watched a bunch of videos um, and noticed that Adam was facilitating that night and someone was already signed up for a bunch of those tools. So I reached out to Adam and he told me to come in and he was like, yeah, I'm already teaching someone those things. So I exactly what you said just mm -hmm. happened to occur and it worked out really well super easy and fun so yeah it's 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 very nice it's pretty low stress don't um it's badging is a relatively short process where you're just trying to get in and get started with something so so make sure that you schedule it that you sort of plan that way so that you're not burning time but once you're in and doing it the actual process of getting the badge is, is a lot more pleasant than like the, the practical lab tests that you might have had to do in college or something. So it's, it's certainly a little bit better that way. Um, I also, I don't think it should be viewed as a test. This is, we're not, they're not judging you. There's, there's no, if there's something that you don't know when we're there, this is the time for you to learn it. Um, so the, the, don't feel pressure or stress. So just say the wood burner is something completely different um, that we should like be, maybe look look into later, or um, for the woodworking. Oh, for the for the river and the CNC. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, for for right now, we're gonna say those are interesting tools. If you already know the other ones and you want to hop into that, you should already know that that's the thing that you want to do, and you've got the other skills sort of like already started. Um, and there's definitely going to be a few people that have that experience in every group. And so if like, usually if you have a little bit of, if you wanted to go after the CNC, you totally can, but the, the Shapoko is brand new, which is our like entry CNC. Um, Lior was going to do the video for the Shapoko. Is that up yet? Uh, I'm waiting for the touch off early because I think that will make it a real solid. 
it will be real solid. So, so we're still like, there's not even a badging video for that yet. Um, and so that's a, that's a good reason to say, let's hold off on the Shipoko in addition to learning the heart, the hand woodworking tools, the table saw, some of those traditional ones. It's good to stay focused together that, on that stuff this week. Sure. Do you want to talk into the microphone? Um, so there are a bunch of badges that don't require a checkout. And among those are the woodshop badge. You'll see the door to the woodshop labeled with the woodshop badge. And so if you go to the equipment page on the website, then you can see all the tools listed and you can click on the tools. And some of them, like a hand drill, will just have a video. It doesn't even require a badge, which means a guest, you know, someone who's not a member can use that tool and you can use it without getting a badge. Some things just have a video. Once you do the video and, and quiz, you're good to go. Um, and that includes the, the wood shop. So that video is just a walk around tour of the whole wood shop going over all the little bits and pieces that just make it easier to use the space, knowing how to use the air connections and how to pull down the power cords. Cause I see a lot of people just like waiting for it to click, right? And so there's a lot of little things like that, that it'll just make using the wood shop more fun. And on that page, if you scroll down past the badging video for the wood shop, there's a video that overlaps heavily with the class that Corey just taught, but also has some other things about woodworking at large. And it's also, it also takes place in the workshop. So it, you know, if you want to just gain a little more comfort with the idea of like what all the tools are for and, you know, what you might look to in each area, you can watch that video and speed it up now that you know half the things in it and see like, oh, that's, that's what a table saw is for. Oh, that's what like end grain looks like, et cetera. So those are just two other things. And there are a lot of other tools that don't require a checkout. So you're welcome to click through and see like, oh, you can learn how to sharpen that. There's a lot of things you can do that don't actually require a checkout. So you can get started even more quickly. That's a really good point. Other questions, thoughts, concerns before we start show and tell? No, no. All, all right, right. great. great. Um, Show and, show and tell, tell this, this week is, is going, going to be a little, little bit, bit different, different because, because it is a totally digital format. Every, everything that everybody made was completely digital uh, as far as I know. And so you should have all sent me URL links or most of you have sent me URL links. and I've got them pulled up in a browser tab. So all I'm going to do is just control tab through and that's going to be the order that we go in. So if, if yours comes up, we'd like to hand you the microphone or if you're at home, if you'd want to unmute, you can sort of guide me through the navigation if you'd like. Um, and, then, and then we'll go through and sort of celebrate all the cool stuff that we made that way. And so I'm sure that there's going to be neat things that we see, some shared experiences to talk about. And so this is a really fun and important time in our foundations class. This is our first show and tell. So really um, feel free to, to chat with each other, to celebrate cool stuff they did. It always feels great to be complimented. So don't, don't keep your compliments to yourself. Um, make sure that people know that you're here and enjoying what they're making. So there's lots of fun to be had with that. And uh, let's, let's get to it. So Zoom, I got to do some logistics on my end. Cursor, this, more, share screen. All right, so on here, we'll hit control tab. And first up is Senum. So if you would unmute and tell us a little bit about your site. Sure. Um, so I was looking through Google sites and everything and, you know, freaked out a little bit. It was a lot. Um, and then I remembered this handy site that I had earlier made um, for my portfolio that I hadn't touched in a while. Um, so I decided I would update it and add a page for um, foundations course. So it's just like um, a page you can just go through, like there's an about me and then it, it's like a slide bunch of slides that goes through my, um, on this. So yeah, the skills and then just kind of like, it's, it's a personal website that I sometimes send it to, um, you know, possible employers and things like that. And you can find my LinkedIn and up on that about me, there are two arrows that like scroll through to see, um, yeah, exactly. My work, work 
work experience, a um, couple other things. I think it's just like awards and education and stuff like that. So um, if you scroll up, you'll find Foundations of Fabrication, which is where most of this week's um, thing is in. So I made this a um, blog because I was, and yeah, if you just like click, click onto it, um, I, I kind of explain it on the, oh, I'm getting a lot of feedback. All right, great. Um, so I kind of explained it in my blog as well, where I just kind of tried to explain that I do like writing, um, but I absolutely detest writing about my work um, because I feel like I'm never going to um, do justice to either side, either the writing side or the work side. Um, so when I realized Wix has a blog um, kind of widget sort of thing, um, I decided maybe it's a nice little um, compromise where I can write with a little bit of humor, like semi-serious, and then just kind of go through things. So this is what I decided I'm going to be writing blog posts, um, explaining my work kind of every week. So that's the first part. And the second part is my logo design, um, where I started with uh, these beautiful sketches. Um, and I do explain I'm not very creative. Um, <laughs> I wanted to go with the name, you know, my name is Sinan Sunma, so there's a bit of an illustration. So I was thinking, okay, I can go with two S's. Um, what can I do with that? That middle one, I'm pretty sure it's a blade. At some point I came up with that. I was like, okay, maybe not that. Um, so I decided I would watch a bunch of uh, videos by Logos by Nick and try to get some inspiration from there. So I went with that and I realized, okay, it's time to get my hands dirty. So I opened up um, and I start, I typed an S and I was going through um, different fonts and I saw, okay, there's that, the Greek font. So I was like, okay, I can use a Sigma and maybe do something out of it. So I started with that Sigma and I tried to like put it together in some way that would make some sense. And I ended up in that um, hourglass shape and I was like, okay, that's cute, but let me, you know, go a little bit more abstract, try other things. And then that last one I enjoyed, but I was like, oh, it looks like too much like um gmail um so i tried maybe a little more abstract but i was like okay it's too abstract so let me change the colors so i changed the colors and i used the the um what is the um kind of exclusion tool path exclusion that was cute so i like kind of played around with that and i was like okay that's nice but it still doesn't feel like too full so i did like i saw nick do um take the nodes and like push them in and do different things. So I took two nodes and kind of like pushed it in. I was like, okay, that looks cute. And I looked at it a little bit and I was like, okay, the blue kind of looks like the ocean and I'm from a beach town. So maybe I can kind of change the colors a little bit to represent my love for the ocean by like making it like ocean in the earth, ocean in the sand sort of thing. So I played around with like different colors. So. Those are my last three choices. I haven't really decided which one will be my logo yet exactly, but so there's the black, the green, and kind of the sand colored. Um, and I was like, okay, that's two S's, stands for SS, but like hourglass for, you know, my efficiency when I'm working um, and my love for everything that's nature. Oh, I can't hear you, but. <laughs> Yeah, very, very nice. And sorry if there's feedback, but the it looks it looks great. Um, super excited. And hopefully you you had an enjoyable time doing that. It's really amazing how those logos can progress all the way from like a weird, like let's just start with initials and then you go you go into all sorts of weird, weird directions. And it can take a while. Um, so so great work. That was lots of fun. Um, let's see. Next, next up. Uh, Elena, Elena, sorry, I got in it right before. And I was thinking about this while Sinem went. Do you want to come sit here and scroll on your own so that it's your, your guiding? That can be helpful sometimes. In the hot seat. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, my site. I used Google Sites. I've never built a website before, and this seems uh, pretty easy. 
Uh, so this is a picture that I took impressively. It's like the best picture I've ever taken. Uh, green is also my favorite color. So this was lots of green. Um, this is just my like home landing page. Um, decided this is gonna be my catchphrase for this class, dedication to documentation. Um, this is gonna be where I slap all of my failures and successes. Um, and so if you've made it here, you've made it to my mind. Um, and this is where I'm going to log everything. So eventually I'm going to figure out how to, whenever you oh, link here. So whenever you click on these weeks, you get taken to my links here. Um, but we'll have added on each week as we progress and some little picture icon representing what we're doing that week. Um, but that's just the home page. Then if we go to about me, um, I have this little blurb. You can read it if you're interested, but um, just about me. And then I have a bunch of pictures of my dog because I didn't know really how to fill this space, but I love her. So Perfect. that's yeah. fun. <laughs> uh, scroll through that if you want to see goofy pictures of her. Um, and then here's my logo design. So uh, this, I think, is the format that I'm going to keep each week, kind of a one sentence description of the assignment, um, some predictions, because going into this, I had no idea how it was going to go, but I thought it would be easier than it ended up being, um, some failures and some successes. So uh, it wasn't too difficult to build the logo, but uh, Inkscape was definitely more challenging than I gave it credit for. Um, and I had some issues where uh, I would use the union function and then later realize I needed just one piece of that after I had already like joined them. So uh, my successes were that as I got more comfortable, I realized that I could just group things and then go back to them um, or just like keep copies of disassembled pieces like floating in the sides. Um, so this is like the beginning to the end. Um, this is my like on paper sketch, um, just brainstorming session. And then this is my final logo. Uh, so my full name is Alina Higgins. So you have this kind of big A and then hidden H um, cut out of it. Uh, pretty simple, but I'm pretty proud of it. <laughs> uh, and then this is the step-by-step -step of how it went in Inkscape. So even though it's just two letters, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't just using text to do this. And so made it all with shapes. Um, turns out A and H are just a bunch of rectangles um, tilted and merged together, but uh, this is how it went. So realize that if your H legs are the same length as your A legs, um, turns into another A. So you gotta shorten those a little bit. Um, and then had to play around with how thick the H was going to be and how long it was going to be. Um, and then that was my final selection. So once I lengthened it out a little bit, this is what I got. That's awesome. <laughs> I, mean, I would have never, I would have never guessed that that was your first foray into Inkscape. You definitely handled it like a boss and those little tips of like keep extra copies off to the side can be really helpful uh, while you're building stuff. Let's see, all right. Next up, we've got Bruce. Do you, do you wanna, do you wanna come on up? No, you're two words this morning. My board meant Um So this is a very simple website. Uh, it only has one main page and one uh, about me page where there is a pretty simple <laughs> instruction about me. Um, and I was actually thinking about transferring from, um, can I put this? Where is the mouse? Transferring from, uh, changing from this uh, WordPress to Google Sites because it always added this loud sentence at the end of each of the page. It kind of makes the page uglier than they want it to be. Uh, about the logo, I designed, so I have this big idea in my mind that during this whole course um, of foundation of fabrication, I'm going to make a bicycle 
or cycling my center topic. For example, maybe uh, during the lessons about uh, Raspberry Pi or uh, Arduino, I'm going to make some speedometers that I can attach to my bicycle to test the speed. Or maybe I can make some phone controlled um, rare lights to indicate my position during the nights. Um, if I can get a GPS unit, maybe I can use that to make a cyclo computer also. So, so I thought about making an icon or logo uh, that is connected not with my name, but to cycling. Um, then I started with this bicycle geometry chart, which you can find, can I, can I touch it? Um, polygon, maybe. Okay. Um, so I thought about this device called charts, geometry charts, which is very common that you can see on almost every um, bike website. So maybe, oops, what's going on? Yes, it's a geometry chart. I should be able to scroll them down. So initially I wanted to reproduce this. And it was when I went to the steps where I kind of have these lines in the in the in the in space, I thought about why don't I just make something more artistic rather than the uh, strict ge geometric design of this. So I had this, I mean, yeah, it's a very abstract form that I had. I um, had some steps here uh, where you can smooth out the, the lines with a certain function that is built in with in space. And I actually had some trouble making these lines into the same uh, width because when you just stretching them or moving them around, the, the width will change. But it doesn't matter. It, it didn't matter in the end because it looked more artistic if you put these lines in the uh, in different width. Yeah, it looks kind of like a sketch, which is really cool to get that sort of effect where you just draw on that. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, it's a weird default. Mm -hmm. I don't like there's a checkbox hidden somewhere, and when you check that, it doesn't do that. But it's weird that I don't like that that's just default. But yeah. yeah. So next time, I'm, if I didn't know that box, I might just, and if I wanted them to be in the same width, I might just select all of them and just input that right. one there, maybe. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. All right, next up, let's see, control tab. We have, uh, this is probably Vincent. Yeah. And so Vincent, if you want, you could share your screen with us and I can stop sharing, or do you want me to just sort of click through? This is the Zoom wait. The Zoom wait. Vincent is here. All right, maybe maybe audio is tricky. We'll come back. We'll cycle back through. Let's hop on to the next you one. Hear me now? Oh How yeah, we can hear you now. You good? How about? Uh, would you like to share or should I click through and take a look at the website? Vincent, let's keep playing with your audio uh, and we'll we'll circle back to you. We've got- Okay, um, uh, you can't hear me though, right? Oh, I can, now I can hear you. Now I can hear you. Sorry. Oh, now we've okay, got great. Oh, okay, great. Cool. All right. Okay. So, yeah. So I said that I'll try to share my screen and you can let me know how smooth it looks. 
Cool. Um, one second, I'll stop my share and you can share your screen. Okay. Let's see. Do, do, do. Disabled screen sharing. Okay, yeah, I guess we could just talk through it. Yeah, my bad. That's it's probably wait, hold on. I don't I that's gonna take me a second. It's been a while on Zoom. I'll just click through. Yeah, let me get back to sharing my screen. Sorry. I'm very good at Google. Oh, you had it for a second there. There you go. Okay, great. How's that look? Sounds good. Okay. So yeah, so, yeah. This, is, um, this is um a, a rabbit, particularly a rabbit. um my pet rabbit, Hoppy. I tried to spend more of the time on the um, logo as opposed to on the website, try to keep the website um, a little simpler in terms of whatever theme was there. I was going to, to just go with that one. I wrote it using ViewPress. It's a static, um, statically generated website. So once you get all the theming and whatnot set up, then you can focus just on the content. Um, and for this icon here, I really had no idea how I was going to make something like this with Inkscape um, using just basic shapes. So I, I figured I'm going to have to trace this. I'm going to have to take an image that, um, that I have, like a photo that I've taken, and try to vectorize that somehow. Um, and after looking at some videos with logos by Nick, I saw that there was a way to do that using, I believe, Bezier curves. If I step through the site, you'll be able to, to see a little more of what I wrote about it. But if you go to see my progress, it then brings you to like the blog type section. There's an intro, um, just talking about what the website's about. And then I'm going to be adding things as I go along. So for this unit, I spent most of the time on Inkscape. Um, there, there were some issues um, setting up the website I would have added more photos, um, but I decided to hold off on the photos until the last. Um, I lost my train of thought. What was I saying earlier? Oh yes, the the um, vector. I took an image of of my pet rabbit, had a sketch of it, and then used like Bezier curves to um, trace that out, and then convert that into a vector. Cool. And that's pretty much it. There's also the yeah. about page, which I'll also be adding to. Yeah, that's awesome. It's really neat to see the, the solution because this is sort of your wheelhouse to see your, your tech solution. And Vue is a cool open source. Um, it's an open source styling platform, right? Sort of. Uh, ViewPress? Yeah, just trying to summarize how ViewPress fits into the world. Kind of, really yeah. Quick. You you can use it as an alternative to Google Sites, and it has some built-in theming. So, like the sidebar is built in, things like that. Yep. Yeah, it's really neat. I'm excited to see it and to see how the the photos piece works in. And I'm I'm sure that you're gonna crush it with that. And the Bezier yeah. curves are definitely a good thing to have mastered. So, awesome. Okay, cool. Um, Very nice. Also, one of the reasons, oh. one of the reasons why um, it I had issues with the website was because I had issues with um, DNS. The reason why this is called Foundations of Ferocious Bunnies is because I have a domain name called ferociousbunnies.com, and I was going to make it Foundations <laughs> of dot ferociousbunnies.com, um, but I had some issues with DNS because I already had it used for something else and whatnot. If I ever get that straightened out, then this will make a little more sense. <laughs> That's a fun URL to have. Uh, way to go. That's really Thanks. cool. Uh, all right, let's see. So if you could stop sharing, I'll go back to doing the sharing on my end. Do this screen too, hit share, and do some moving around of Zoom settings. And then control tab up here. We've got Annie. Annie, do you want to come up and tell us about your website? 
All right, thank you. And I'm gonna... Because it has been like struggle for me really to understand all this. Um, but I did this last week and I really like to decorate, like making like small changes in, in houses, mostly in my house. And um, no, this is just the beginning for now. Cool. And I try to do uh, something like this using Inkscape. I told you, I just like, yeah. didn't like, oh my God, this is not as easy as I thought it's going to be. I think it's hard at the beginning to get started with anything. And just like taking the yeah. first couple of steps is really great. Your, you know, the website that you put together, I clicked through a little bit for each one of these. So I've had a little time to be able to see. So and this is like that, like my idea, like, like changing like a few things in your house, you know, like, oh, I, so I'm just here to learn. So that's good. Yeah. I was just having fun doing this. But. That's great. It's a great looking website. And I feel like you did such a nice job with all the photos and the clean, the, the clean look. It, you never know when you first look like. Exactly. Yeah. That's the truth. That's a, yeah, great job. All right, and let's see, control tab into the next one. Yushi, you wanna come on up? Time to tell us a little bit about uh, what you've got going on here. Um, so I don't have much going on here. <laughs> uh, so I just found this picture on a um, free like stock image site. I thought it was, it just looks great. <laughs> just use it. Um, like eventually I'll have selected work put on here. Um, but right now it's just like um, taking, taking, taking the spot here. And then about me, I don't love to write about myself. <laughs> so I just uh, have left them blank for now. Uh, and then the projects, I made all the sub pages. So for anyone who was uh, thinking of like uh, making like a link that, that goes to um, your projects, I asked Corey about that. Um, so here are my links. And uh, if you click on any link, he'll take you to, oh, whatever. I don't have the sub page for now, but um, these will go to these pages. Sometimes it really, it really helps you can link to them and even if you're going to fill them in with stuff later so yeah. just like having them and having them be there can be really helpful and i hopefully you're able to see looking at other people's websites sort of how everybody's solving that shared problem and getting some inspiration from what other people are doing to make to make all these pieces come together and just a tiny bit about my logo i um so that was my logo that's just my name <laughs> So Yushi is two words. Uh, Yushi is not one word, but two words. Uh, Yu is rain and uh, Shi is poem. And this character is poem. So just use that and that's it. That's a great logo. Very nice. <laughs> right. Let's see, and then we can control tab over to the next one. And we've, we've got, got Renee. Renee, Renee we're we gonna come up, up. talk to us a little bit and sort of find your way to snake through. We were clicking through yours before class. So you might need to navigate back to the main thing. Yeah, I was like, how do I? Trackpad, it's weird. Um, oh, okay, yep. I see that. Yep. Um, cool, okay, let me get to the beginning. Okay, so I used Notion. Um, sorry, I'm having like a little trouble seeing. Do, here. I think. Um, control and oh thanks yeah um so this is my main page um and this is like i wanted this to be like a private website that was just a hub for all of my stuff um and was really really easy to document um so i have like a page for basic information like my intention for the class so that i don't forget 
um, a really easy place to sort ideas, notes for the class, and then like tasks. And then this is where I wanted to put like all my units. So there'll be a page for each unit. Um, then I have like some little things like when it was last edited, when the project is due, um, ideas, what badges I need for this project. Um, oops, sorry. And then I have some little links like the overview link, the slides. Um, I wanted to write a little bit for each unit, like what are my thoughts going into this? What am I gonna learn? Um, and then like, you know, what is my actual process? And then, you know, like, what did I learn after the unit and what did I enjoy? Um, and then going into my logo process, um, this is just a link to like my Pinterest board with my visual inspiration for this specific project. And then as a designer, I like to start every logo project with a word list. So I was just thinking about what I wanted to capture in this logo, which is like things that I was going through in this class, which is like focusing on the process, focusing on learning, making connections, um, putting practice over final product, adding tools to my tool belt. Um, thought about a Swiss army knife. I was like, oh, that's kind of cheesy. But that image kept coming to my head, um, you know, creation, et cetera. Um, these are my initial sketches. I didn't mean to click on this, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> so, you know, these are pretty rough sketches, but you can kind of see where my train of thought was going. Over here, I was kind of playing with this idea of like a black hole or like a portal that was like spitting information into new places. Cause I was thinking about creativity being using information in new contexts. Um, and so I liked that idea. And then I ended up with um, a few, there's a few other sketches there that were, that I, didn't take a picture of that I did later. Um, so this is one of them. Um, these are my first mock-ups. I did these in Illustrator. I didn't mean to click this. Um, so I like the idea of kind of just playing with this like really friendly R um, that had like a lot of character to it. This is Clorendon, which is a typeface that I like a lot. And then this kind of squiggly organic maker like frame um, on the outside. I just thought there was a fun juxtaposition there. That's what I ended up going with. But these are some other mock ups that I did playing with the whole portal idea, playing with conjoining shapes, like, you know, simple shapes conjoining to make a more complicated form. Um, and then these are some of my refined mock ups. And then these are my final ones. I really like the stitching on the edge. It makes me think of the tufting that you're already like knocking yes. out of the park. I love tufting. Oh, oh my gosh, sorry guys. So these are my colors. Um, I wanted something super contrasty. I started playing with how those colors would work in relation to each other and how the typefaces would pair. Um, I paired it with an extended typeface because I wanted it to kind of mimic like the goofiness of this um, frame um, that kind of has some movement in it and some extension. So the typeface is also kind of, it feels a little bit stretched, but it's designed that way. And then this is me just kind of playing around um, with like, how might this look with the pattern, playing with some other colors. And then these are my final color combinations. And then, you know, just kind of like some lockups of text and a logo. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's incredible. <laughs> Feels like uh, that's great. Feels like a master class in design, just right there. Um, I definitely, definitely learned, learned some things. things. Uh, awesome. awesome. Next, 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 next up, up and there is, you know, each, each, each website, website is their, their, their own thing. thing. Uh, let's, let's see this. Let, next, next up, we've got, got Norman. And, and so, Norm. Norm you're, I would, I would love, love you to introduce yourself. This is your website that is, is, is fresh and new. new. And, and if I can, can I'm gonna pull you, let's see. see. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna just hop over and actually stop the share, share and put 
put, put you up, up on screen, screen. So, so you can chat and say hi. And, and, and because, because you weren't with us last week, week you were somewhere delightful. delightful. Can, you can you tell us a little bit about, about yourself, yourself where, where, where you were? Because it's fun and exciting. And then just say hi for all of us. And things that we went through last week. We said, we said your name, name your, your pronouns, and a, a little, little bit about yourself that you'd like to share, like um, what, 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 you what you did for work, what you, what you do for fun now, any, any, any of that, that sort of stuff. stuff. Oh, but right now it looks like you may still have your sound off. And if you want, we can play around. We can go to the next person and then cycle back because sound is always tricky. How about now? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you now. Ah, good. Okay. Um, yeah. So I was. Uh, I've been on vacation for a week and a half since before the course started. So um, when I got back, uh, I uh, said, "Oh, geez, I've got this course to look at." And I uh, saw that uh, you needed to know Google Sites and uh, Inkscape. So, um, and I also, in, in, in the first uh, week uh, playback, they said you could either uh, do whatever your time permits, and there it is, or you could uh, think what you really want and your time has to fit it. So I decided to take the first approach and just uh, see whether I could use uh, uh, Inkscape and, um, and uh, Google Sites. Um, and um, that's it. So that's, that's what I did. There's a logo that uh, just is my initials uh, and tabs and uh, you know a place where uh, it's kind of an easel to write things about projects, should I have anything. Um, uh, and uh, that's it, just, just really kind of bare bones because I didn't have much time. Uh, where I was was great, I was hiking in Italy. Uh, we, I was kind of scared to go because um, uh, of COVID of course. And, uh, but when I got there, there was a very low COVID rate in the in the north of Italy where I was, and uh, so I felt really safe and got back, and so it's all good. And I did manage to figure out how to find Inkscape and how to find Google Sites, and um, you know I'll build it out uh, as the weeks go by. That sounds great. Uh, I'm glad you had a great time, and we look forward to to meeting you in the woodshop, Norm. Great. Yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing. Let's see. All right, now I'm gonna hop back over and get set back. I guess I should see who's next up in the. We've got Arvia. So Arvia, I'm gonna. You've got a second or two while I get things configured, but you can come on up. And I think that will be. Do 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 do. Share screen. I love that photo. So like. <laughs> that's great. Okay. Um, I'm definitely not finished, so you'll see that the description in there is still the Google description. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is my website. Um, this is a picture of me when I, one of my favorite pictures of me when I was a kid. I got my mom's lipstick. <laughs> I feel like it, <laughs> I feel like it really embodies me as a person. I'm pretty well. People say I'm rebellious, but I'm not. I'm just an organizer, but um, so I put some of my favorite quotes by some of my favorite black women, um, feminists, authors, activists, just people that I follow. Um, so one from Audre Lorde and one from Octavia Butler. It's really important for me to center both my blackness and my womanhood. So I made sure I put um, that I'm a black woman maker and a black creator and a black artist. Um, I will change this and put a class overview here and I will put my <laughs> about me here. <laughs> There's a picture of me. This, this is a picture. You can't see the full thing. I need to figure out how to um, pull it down, but this is a picture of me shooting at one of the actions that me and some of my organizer friends um, organized in here in New Haven. Um, this will fill up with my week to week class portfolio. Um, I have, I just threw a little video in here. This is from a, <laughs> this is from one of the projects that I did at my house that I thought was gonna be beautiful. And it was a beautiful process. I learned a lot, but this mirror did not, <laughs> it basically does not show the image of me in the way that it's supposed to, it's a little distorted, but it's a really cool piece. And 
I'm trying to figure out what to do with it. I don't want to throw it away, but isn't my apartment's too small and <laughs> it's huge. But that I put that little video there to remind myself of being in the process and not being a perfectionist, which is hard for me. Um, but I I'm realizing watching y'all stuff, I didn't document, there's nothing here still either. <laughs> but I didn't document my process of my my logo. Um which I'm gonna to try to do a better job at that, like take grabbing screenshots and things like that. But this is my logo. Um, I was playing, I love circles and I love the color yellow and my business slash art platform, I'm still work, trying to work out details. It's called um, Zora, the coming of the sun. So the name Zora means the coming of the sun or dawn. And for a long time, I, I stopped like, being an artist for years to be a political activist in um, the last probably like five years of my life. I'm just like, no, I can't do that anymore. So I feel like this class and like the process is like my coming of the sun. So I was playing with circles and shapes to in reminiscent of like a sun rising. Um, and I also am, I really love uh, like textile prints that play with shapes and things like that. So I was, I was like looking at some um, like West African prints. Um, I love like mud cloth and things like that. Um, so trying to play with like textile shapes. So yeah, that is, that is it. I'm probably going to have another section with where I'll put some of my other like um, stuff that I'm doing outside of the class in here. Cool. Um, but yeah, that's my page. That, that's awesome. I love how the, you, it's clear that you've got so, such a like depth of, of a range of different things that you're trying, that you're putting into that website. It's really cool to see that. Thank you. Yeah. Very nice. It's like a, it's like a fledgling start, but you can see that there's a lot ready to, ready to, ready to shine. Let's see. All right. All right. Next up, up we have. Do, 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 home, wait, hold, let's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. do you wanna, wanna come, come on up and click through? Make a hallway down the middle. Maybe we do the three, two and then three. Um, I really made it more about this year than I did about me. And I'll have to reconsider whether I have to put a little more me in there or not, but there is a little me in there. So um, I started by actually, okay, deciding to use Google Sites after I explored maybe instead trying to just do a straight blog. But then I felt like I've always wanted to make a site. So why don't I start here and um, see what the thinking is to break out all the things we need to say. Mm -hmm. um, so once I decided on that and I chose the, uh, the, the template that I was gonna use, which is just like your template, um, I went hunting through my images and um, zeroed in on this, is this photograph I took is this past year, actually two years, I've been really into plants and working with them artistically um, and what they represent to me. So then uh, based on that is how I came up with the logo. Um, which I could tell more about when I get to that page. But um, so I decided, you know, that the homepage would just kind of break out what's going to be in here. Um, and there's two ways to get to each week's assignment. You could either click the links and I'll make them live as we go along. Makes sense. And other than that, in the units area, you can do it as well. So um, I also made links here so that, because I realized maybe somebody's gonna wanna know about me and they might somehow not find the, nav the navigation. So you can get to me here, you can get to the program this way. Anyway, so, um, oops, yeah. All those little links, they do, they do add up on web pages. It's a lot of time to put in, but it really feels like you're making a website when you've got tons of links that go different places. Yeah, and, and at the moment, um, I realize there's no images here, but um, I went through a really fun process to design the logo. And I actually did 
try to put it in here, but something odd happened. I mean, I know I can't put an SVG in there, right? Oh, it, Google Sites won't let you. It can be weird, but you can usually convert to a PNG. And then well, it's... I know, so I did, but um, yeah. it just wasn't looking sharp for some reason. So I, I've just got to try again. Yeah, um, we can take a look anytime. Yeah, I mean, I, I work in all, actually I did the logo in Illustrator, so. That's totally uh, fine. So I brought it into Photoshop. I can make it any size, you know, to put mm -hmm. whatever. So I have yet to add it so you can see what I'm talking about and maybe my process which was literally um, simplifying that plant that you saw on the yeah. homepage, which to me, I mean, it's a seed head and um, it represented everything to me that I, I see this year as being. Um, That's awesome. I really love how clearly and cleanly it just represents that plant, that seed. It makes me think of new beginnings all through. Yeah. So I explained it here. I, I really, I don't know, so far I, I felt like I want to focus on what is it that I need to do here, get it done mm -hmm. and move on so I could, uh, you know, start on to the next thing. So pretty much it's, it's quite simple. Cool. Yeah, that's very nice. A, a, a simple, simple website, website can, can be a, be a real elegant, elegant thing, just a way to, way to, get, to, to get, get your ideas, ideas up and out and, out and like and and having, having it underway. underway. James, James, this is this is you. you. Uh, there is actually not a whole lot to say. <laughs> it's uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, just straight Google Sites. I stole this from the Make Haven site somehow. That's fine. <laughs> I steal most of Make Haven's logo and branding. So go for it. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a uh, there's going to be hopefully images here for each unit which we'll click through to subpages, which have nothing on them, uh, <laughs> but will eventually. The about me is, I think I wrote one sentence and there's me at the top of East Rock in a blizzard. <laughs> That's it. Um, the only other thing is my little logo that I made. Um, I messed around on Inkscape for like hours, <laughs> like making all kinds of crazy designs and shapes and whatever. And uh, that was just one of the kooky J's that I made that I stuck up there. So I'll probably keep messing with that. Yeah. Uh, and that's it. That, that's great. Thank you very much. Cool. Yeah, it's it, the, uh, I'm, I'm amazed, amazed at, at the professional, professional designers, designers and, and artists, artists because, because for me, for me design, design things like, like that can be like a wormhole that, that is a never ending, ending place, place to put time. time. But, but it's, it's really, really cool, cool to see what, what happens when, when, when people have cool ideas. ideas. All, right. All right, and then, oh, oh this, this is the, the polygon, polygon thing. thing. And let's see, see did anybody spin in one of these while we were, were out and away? away? Uh, no, no, I think, I think we got everybody. everybody. All, right. All, right. All right, so, so that, that is a complete show and tell for our, for our, our first, first class where everybody made something, a chance to come together. Uh, uh, there's, there's there's only a couple of things, things that are that are, that are left. left. Let, Let me do. do I'm gonna uh, stop, stop the screen, screen share, put faces back up on on screen. screen. There's, there's just a little bit left, left to do for us while we're together, together like this. this. I, I want to make, make sure that we that we, that we say the, the, the last, last little bit. bit. And, and so, so mostly, mostly that was awesome. First off, a major impressions. It was really cool to see what people made, even if you feel like it was just something that's sort of basic. And sometimes it can be tough. Because you, you see people in the, in the class, class make really, really cool stuff, stuff and, and you're a little jealous, jealous you wish you want to be there. there. But, but everybody, you, you got to remember, our goal is to focus, focus on finding where you're at and moving forward. forward. So, so everybody's going to have a different place, place at your beginning. beginning. And, and I'm, I'm really excited because everybody, I think, grew. And, and I was really impressed with how most of you were just fiercely independent this week. Uh, which, which is which was neat to see, see but I, I look forward to us all being able to support each, each other in the near future as we head, head into this wild woodworking world, world together. together. There's, there's going to be all sorts of chances for us to be supportive, supportive and, and to, to, to connect. connect. Um, so, so it's, it's, it's really, really cool to see all this come, come together. together. Anybody, Anybody have, have any reflections, reflections that you want to share on the the whole experience of seeing all the websites? Or I've got, I guess, two questions that I want to ask in one shot, and then we'll pass around the microphone in case anybody's got any thoughts or ideas. I'm going to hand it to Paul first. 
but the any like what are the main things that you're like whoa this was really neat from seeing everybody's websites and or what are your thoughts for the very first tool that you want to try and get a badge on so the very first tool that I want to try to get a badge on is in the metal shop. So that's not going to be relevant here. Um, I love seeing people document their process. I think that's really cool. I think it's very easy to see things kind of jump really quick, but the people who really took the time to kind of break down those steps, I think it's going to be really informative for themselves and other people who go to their website. Um, but I think it's amazing that everybody dove into this because um, I work at a company that makes websites for a living and it takes teams of people to agonize over all of it. So great job. Um, I'm not sure what, which one I'm going to badge on first because I haven't seen through the whole SD and I'm going to watch, check the videos um, until later. Um, so I noticed that James Webster has a particular thing that I want to learn from and maybe also you should uh, forgive me if I forget about others. Uh, so they, when they're listing the week's projects, they are using photos instead of just simple lists of words, I think it makes things much more clear and attractive when people are scrolling down because a whole long list of just words might, you know, people's eyes might lose their attention or concentration, right? Yeah, that's totally, that's totally true. Uh, All right, things you learned and tool you want to try. It was a total learning experience just to think through um, how you make information uh, digestible by others. Mm -hmm. um, first, you have to, you know, it has to be meaningful to you. But it's interesting to see it up there now and say, oh, my goodness, I could have done this or that. So uh, and then seeing how everybody else approached it. And it was all really wonderful. I think everybody did a great job. Um, I guess the first thing I would probably go for in the wood shop is the jointer just because I don't know, because yeah. I'm going to need it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> cool. All right. We'll just keep, keep going in order. I uh, am astounded how good at vector graphics some people are, <laughs> <laughs> which is cool to see uh, and is like pretty inspiring. Uh, and uh, I guess in the wood shop, I want to go for the holy trinity of the jointer, planer, and table saw. It's, uh, a, it's a good one to go after. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's it. Cool. Alina? Uh, I, whenever I was using Inkscape, was very intimidated by anything with a curve. And so it was very cool to see that almost everyone else had some kind of curve <laughs> in their logo. Um, so it makes me want to go back in and see if I can add in some curvature <laughs> to my logo. Um, and I think the tool that I am most excited in is just the chop saw that's like when i think of working with wood that's like what i want to pull down and use so it's a cathartic one yeah for sure <laughs> um yeah I, I just like really like seeing folks like document like how you document your process and how folks had it categorized um that was really helpful for me to see that it would not have thought of it <laughs> going into it on the digital sense. I think in my head, like create doing like in the wood shop or something, setting up a camera and taking pictures come naturally, but in the digital space, I wouldn't have thought of that. So it was really cool. Um, I don't know which machine I'm looking forward to. I know what I want to make. And I think I just need help thinking. I need help with, I don't know which machine I would do it on. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm just really excited about wood shop in general. So cool. You guys had the great. I'm just like really impressed, and I hope someday I can do something similar as, as you did. That's, that's all. Um, so I was, um, I've been thinking of making a cutting board. <laughs> so I, I think I'll start with the um, uh, jointer, right? Uh, yep. And planner and uh, the table saw. Yep. Uh, so I'll be starting with those three and, and see what's um, what, what, what's next. And um, another thing that technically doesn't really matter, but uh, Ariana, Ariana. Okay, Aria actually um, inspired me because it, it's like a lot of times when I see like, um, you know, like uh, black artists, black um, creators, they, are, they, they take pride in, in, in their identity. So like I was thinking because you when you were mentioning uh, the joinery, mm -hmm. 
that's like I, I just repeatedly hearing people like referring uh, referring that to like Japanese joinery when Chinese joinery was the origin yes. of like right that. <laughs> and, and that was it's totally it's totally a thing and the it's Chinese joinery, Japanese joinery. I, I am not an expert enough to know the difference. Me either. <laughs> that Twitter account specifically is the Japanese joinery. So, but it's really cool to see that tradition come out of Asia in general. And it's really masterful work. There's like those giant uh, temples that are made completely out of wood with no glue, no fasteners. It's incredible what, what has happened over thousands of years. But they're still standing and like perfectly fine. Yeah, and earthquake proof. Yeah, it's masterful, like at a level that is impossible to recreate. Yeah. So yeah, thanks for letting me say that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think for me, it was just cool to make something like to design something that wasn't for work. Um, and to just like do something for play like I was like, all right, like, Technically, this other logo is like a little better, but like this one makes me happier. So like I'm gonna go in this direction because I can do whatever I want. You know, like that was pretty fun. Um, and then, like it was really interesting seeing everyone playing with vectors for the first time and like seeing all the different directions and approaches that people went in. I thought that was really cool. Um, it reminded me a little bit of like, you know, when I was starting out to like learning to make shapes out of different shapes. Um, I think everyone did a really awesome job. Um, and I think the tool I'm excited about learning is the lathe because even though I'm a designer, I hate math. Um, <laughs> so I think the lathe will be the one for me. Um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, and then, and then we have our people. You can press the button on the thing and just turn it off if you want. Um, and we can turn it back on if anybody's got more to add. But anybody at home? There's a couple. Let's see, Robin. We, you might have had a link, and I apologize if I missed it. And if you've got one that you want to share, please do. Or if you want to chime in with what tool you're excited about for anybody who's playing along at home, we'd love to hear and to make sure that you're that you're feeling like part of the group. Yes, um, I just wanted to just share that um, I look forward to um, really dabbling in the website. I got to dabble in um, Inkscape, but I didn't get a chance to really start my website, but I'll probably use um, Google Sites um, or my Medium page, medium.com. So um, it depends on how I feel about it. But I just wanted to say, I'm really looking forward to using the band saw and let's see, and the scroll saw. So those are two things that always really intrigued me ever since I was working at Pelly Clark Pelly. They have a wood shop on the side and they have like a, a few things that are really cool and interesting um, uh, for repair work on the sample materials. So that's something that I always wanted to do for my own self for my own projects. And I enjoyed everyone's projects, but I really was fascinated personally with Arvia and with Sinem. So uh, great job, everyone. Yeah, cool. Very nice. Um, and then any for, let's see, if anybody at home wants to share tools that you're interested in, we can wait. Or if you feel like that's it for the night, we can sign off. We can say, say good night and uh excited to see you in the wood shop this week tuesday thursday or sunday which will be lots of fun thank you goodbye yep yeah thanks good night see you, everybody all right let's see we'll stop